Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This morning, I was planning on asking the Liberals about the health cuts, about the autism funding cuts. Instead, I'm forced to ask this Premier about a media report by David Rivoli about an unprecedented fifth oh, OPP, on, investigation. OPP investigation. OPP investigation. The member from Nepal, Carlton, is warned. Mr. Speaker, an unprecedented fifth OPP investigation. OPP investigation number one, orange scandal. OPP investigation number two, the gas plant scandal. OPP investigations number three and four, the Sudbury bribery scandal. Can the Premier confirm, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier confirm that her Question. government is in fact under a fifth wow. OPP wow. investigation? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Energy will want to comment. Uh, we were not aware of any investigation until the media report, Mr. Speaker. If we are contacted, we will, as always, uh, cooperate fully with authorities. We're taking a cautious and a responsible approach, Mr. Speaker, to offshore wind to allow for the development of research and, uh, and coordination. The Ministry of, of the Environment is doing uh, some of that research, Mr. Speaker, looking at the issue to ensure that we protect the health and safety of, uh, of uh, people and of the environment, Mr. Speaker, and um, we look forward to additional research coming forward. And we stand behind our cautious and responsible, uh, responsible approach to offshore uh, wind. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in uh, I haven't acknowledged you yet. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, to the Premier, in early 2011. Trillium Wind Power was moving ahead with their offshore wind project near Kingston. At 3 p.m. on February 11, 2011, Trillium was set to close a deal on financing that project, a fact that the Liberals were well aware of. At 2.24 p.m. that same day, minutes before the deal was to close, the Liberals put out a press release cancelling the offshore wind program without ever explaining why. When Trillium tried to find out why, there wasn't a single record of the government's decision. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier normally make policy by press releases? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been extremely clear that we would open up the government completely and we've done so to an unprecedented degree. If you choose to go down that road, I think I've made it quite clear I want to go through question period properly. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the allegations are within a time frame, Mr. Speaker, that are covered uh, by this report from the Information and Privacy Commissioner, in which I quote, I have appreciated the cooperation of, I have received from Premier Kathleen Wynne. The Premier issued a directive in accordance with the recommendations made in the report and committed the government to greater transparency and accountability. In addition, political staff received in-depth training on record retention responsibilities, and I applaud these developments, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker, that the opposition are heeing and hawing about the report of the Independent Information Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. Final supplement, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Dodge, deny, deflect, muddy the waters. Let me be a bit more specific. We know the Premier signed the deal to cancel the gas plants in order to save the seat of the Finance Minister. But the question is, why did the Liberal Cabinet cancel the offshore wind project? Is it because the current Economic Development Minister was worried about the planned offshore wind project at the Scarborough Bluffs? Was it to save the Liberal seat in Kingston, or was it because Trillium never donated to the Ontario Liberal Party? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, on the issue of offshore wind, uh, we continue to take a cautious and responsible approach, Mr. Speaker. There are thousands of land-based wind turbines around the world, backed by decades of science and experience, Mr. Speaker. Offshore wind in freshwater lakes is still at early stages Remember of development, Mr. Grindle. Speaker, worldwide. That's why we still have a moratorium on offshore wind development. The Ministry of Environment continues to research this issue to ensure we protect our health and the health of our environment, Mr. Speaker. And we look forward to additional research the from coming Prince forward Hastings. from the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Even though he's in a different seat, the member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings will come to order because I don't think he heard me because he was still heckling while I was stand asking him to come to order. You have wrap up sentence, please. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We know the Liberals cancelled the gas plants because they were afraid of losing seats in the 2011 election. Yep. That political decision cost Ontario a billion dollars. That billion dollars is being paid by every senior, every family in Ontario on their skyrocketing hydro bills. And now Ontario families and seniors may be on the hook for another $500 million wow. that Trillium is suing for. Wow. Is that the cautious approach the Minister of Energy describes? Premier, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, why should families and seniors pay for yet another Liberal scandal? Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the Minister of Energy has said, there is research that is ongoing, Mr. Speaker. There are there's decades of research on uh, on land-based wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. There is not the same body of research for uh, freshwater freshwater um, lakes, Mr. Speaker. Turbines. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. And whoever said that last one, if I knew who you were, I could bring you to order too. Finish, please. That's why there continues to be a moratorium, Mr. Speaker. We are taking a responsible approach and from here on waiting for that body of research to be developed, Mr. Speaker. Right. The member from Nipissing, come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. I think the government and the Premier is missing the point. Because of their actions, yeah. every family is paying right. more. Here, here. Exactly. And, and exactly. hydro customers are already paying more than $1,000 extra Minister's under the Liberals because of your order. political intervention. Right. Now Trillium, Absolutely. and I'll be very clear on this, is suing the Liberals for $500 million wow. that's going to go on everyone's bill. That's an extra $100 for every home in Ontario. Wow. When is enough enough? Because of your mistakes, everyone in Ontario is paying. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier really think Ontario families and seniors should pay thousands of dollars more because of this government's incompetence? Thank you. This is not the moment in which I ask for attention, and I even am still standing. And when I sit down, you start. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. Premier. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition knows that this matter is before the courts. He also didn't mention, Mr. Speaker, he didn't mention, Mr. Speaker, that their statement of claim was thrown out by the Court of Appeal, Mr. Speaker, and they've restarted that court case, Mr. Speaker, and it's an allegation. But this this party, Mr. Speaker, doesn't know anything about oversight. This this, Mr. Speaker, this government has created the position of financial accountability. Of I will be insistent and consistent. Finish, please. Speaker, this government has created the position of financial accountability officer, made the French language services commissioner independent, Mr. Speaker, put into place. Finish, please. 
I'll complete the list, Mr. Speaker. Put into place the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth. Answer. Allocated new powers to the Provincial Advocate for Children. Expanded the Ombudsman's, ombudsman's role to include oversight of municipalities, school boards, Thank and you. publicly funded universities. Thank you. Final supplementary. No oversight Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. If the, if the Minister of Energy is correct and we can't talk about anything related to an OPP investigation, when there's five, that. The back and forth is not helpful. I'd like to be able to put the question properly as I want the answers to be able to be put properly. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, the, the question is for the Premier. If we can't discuss any matter that's under an OPP investigation, when there is an unprecedented five OPP investigations, you have to leave us something to ask about here in the Legislature. You know, the billions of dollars wasted on e-health and orange scandals are being felt in every community in Ontario. Sure. Hospitals being closed, doctors being fired, nurses being let go. The billions of dollars wasted on smart meters and gas plants are being felt. I'm sorry, but I'm getting challenged to the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, the member from Hamilton Mountain, and the member from Trinity Spadina. Come to order. Carry on. Those scandals are being felt in every bill, Mr. Speaker. Life is getting harder question. under the Liberals. So my question is, does this government not appreciate that it's harder and harder for families and seniors? They do, does, does this government not care that people can't get the health care they you. need? Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, the opposition continues to ignore what's really happening in the electricity sector, Mr. Speaker. They have acknowledged and they support what's happening in the nuclear sector. Member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Finish, please. They acknowledge and support what's happening in the nuclear sector, Mr. Speaker, where for the next 30 years we are going to be introducing into the grid electricity at 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. We'll be producing clean energy. They refuse to acknowledge that wind prices, Mr. Speaker, are coming in at grid rate now, Mr. Speaker, at 8.5 cents a kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. They've been haranguing us about wind, and they now know that wind is successful, Mr. Speaker. They can't face the truth, Mr. No question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Apparently, the Liberals uh, ripped up energy contracts for political gain. Again. Again. It's alleged they destroyed energy-related documents. Again. Again. And now the OPP anti-rackets branch is investigating the Premier's office. Again. Again. The Premier signed off on the gas plants cancellation. Speaker, what was her role in the cancelling of the wind projects? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I have uh, just said, we were not aware of uh, any investigation until the media report. Uh, if we're contacted, we will obviously uh, cooperate fully. We're taking a cautious and a responsible approach to offshore wind in order to allow for the development of research and uh, coordination, Mr. Speaker. The Ministry of the, um, the Environment is uh, is undertaking that research, Mr. Speaker. And you know, the fact is that there is uh, there's a large body of research that uh, that backs up the placement of uh, land-based wind turbines uh, around the world, Mr. Speaker. That same body of research does not exist for, uh, for offshore uh, freshwater uh, wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. We will await that uh, body, of, uh, body of research before decisions are made, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, we have a very serious problem here in the province of Ontario. You know, when the Quebec Liberals were facing scandal after scandal in the construction industry, they decided to clear the air by establishing the Charbonneau Commission. Officially, it was called the Commission of Inquiry on the Awarding and Management of Public Contracts in the Construction Industry. After the gas plant scandal, the Hydro One sell-off, the fundraising quotas in the energy sector, and now the latest OPP investigation, it's time for a similar commission into the energy sector here in Ontario. Will this premier 
do the right thing by the people of this province and call a commission of inquiry on the awarding of management uh, and management rather of public contracts in the energy industry so that Ontarians can get the answers that they so rightly Member from Renfrew, come to order. Premier. Mr. Energy. Mr. Energy. Minister Speaker, I appreciate the uh, the role of the opposition. Uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, they have something in the newspaper, uh, which is in the form of an allegation, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the fact that the opposition is not going to stand up and say anything good about this government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, but I will, Mr. Speaker. You know what? She hasn't mentioned Hydro One lately, Mr. Speaker. She hasn't mentioned Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, because the way we're paying down debt from the proceeds of the IPO, we are saving interest charges, Mr. Speaker, of $100 million a year by paying down debt, Mr. Speaker. Finished. Order. Order. Is the member finished? Wrap, wrap up. Thank you. Gas plants contracts so they could win a handful of seats in Mississauga and Oakville. The Premier admitted that. That cost Ontarians $1.1 billion. It's a Minister of Natural Resources, stop the clock. Uh, Minister of Natural Resources, come to order, and the Deputy House Leader, come to order. Finish, please. That they ripped up fit contracts and then tried to hide the evidence in order to win seats in Scarborough. This could cost Ontarians $500 million or more. These decisions are about helping the Liberal Party, not the people, not green energy or good policy. But people end up paying the price, Speaker, and they deserve the answers. Will this Premier do the right thing by the people of this province and call a commission of inquiry into the awarding and the management of public contracts in Ontario's energy sector? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I understand the role of the opposition, Mr. Speak, Mr. Speaker. But you know, when the leader gets up, it's hard to focus on an answer, Mr. Mr. Speaker. When members of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. When she takes Kenora in the north and she takes Toronto in the south, Mr. Speaker, and she pees all over the map, Mr. Stormont, Speaker, on here. every issue that she could possibly raise in a question. So I choose, Mr. Speaker, to take one aspect of what she's been raised in her shotgun approach, Mr. Speaker, and talk about what's positive happening in this province today, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. She won't ask a question about Moody's investors raising the credit rating, Mr. Speaker, of the province of Ontario, saying that we're meeting our targets. We're growing the economy, Mr. Speaker, and we're creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. She won't talk about any of those, Mr. Speaker. She's embarrassed by how successful we are. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I might re remind uh, the Minister and the Premier that the role of government is actually to work in the interests of Ontarians, not the Liberal Party. That's right. The scandal is not limited, Speaker, 
to gas plants and the fit contracts which were cancelled to help the Liberal Party. The government is selling Hydro One, which doesn't build infrastructure but does help us uh, help out rather a group of bankers who in turn intended, attended private fundraisers with the Minister of Energy and the Minister of Finance. The Liberal Party held a $100,000 fundraiser with private nuclear companies immediately before the government chose private companies and scrapped their plans to work with the OPG. People want their government to focus on making sure that families and businesses have affordable, reliable electricity in this province. But every time the Liberal Party makes a deal, their only question seems to be, how can this help the Liberal Party? Right. Will this Premier question? clear the air, Speaker, and actually call a commission of inquiry like the people Thank you. Minister, uh, the member from Trinity Spadina, it's the second time. Premier. So, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and um, I, I just I, I want to I want to uh, talk to the um, to the uh, member opposite on the uh, the issue of fundraising that she raised, because, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about um, getting ideas from uh, from various uh, parts of the, the province, Mr. Speaker, and from the opposition parties, we actually have uh, asked the uh, PCs and the uh, the NDP and the Green Party to sit down and look at draft legislation. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know the question that the leader of the third third party asked was a very wide-ranging question, and she began with uh, with fundraising, Mr. Speaker. And it's really disappointing. Thank you, Premier. Of all of the parties, so the, the PCs, the NDP and the Green Party, the only party that has refused to come to look at the Answer. draft legislation Shame. and give input is the NDP, Mr. Shame. Speaker. Shame. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, disappointing. The Premier needs to look in the mirror to see what real disappointment is. The people of this province are disappointed in this Liberal government, and they're disappointed in this Premier for the way they're handling the energy fire. When the Liberal government makes energy decisions, Speaker, in this province, the Liberal Party wins and Ontarians lose. It happens time and time again. There is something seriously wrong here, Speaker, and people deserve some basic answers from their government, from their Premier. She has promised openness and transparency. Will she finally, Speaker, take an opportunity to actually fulfill that promise and call a commission of inquiry on the awarding and management? Management of public contracts in the energy sector in this province. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me take another piece of the question that the uh, that the leader of the third party focused on, Mr. Speaker. She talked about Hydro One. Now, I understand that the uh, the leader of the third party and I have a difference of opinion on Hydro One. But here's the thing, Mr. Speaker. I am very surprised that the leader of the third party has not once expressed her support for the building of transit and transportation infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker, and that she doesn't seem to understand that in order to be able to build transit, Mr. Speaker, that we need funding in, able, in, in order to do that, Mr. Speaker. She campaigned on the same fiscal assumptions that we did, Mr. Speaker, and we have moved forward to make those investments. It's very surprising to me, Mr. Speaker, that not only will the NDP not give us substance in terms of fundraising advice, but she also isn't interested in talking about how we should Answer. invest in transit and how we should pay for that, Mr. Speaker. Start, start the clock. You see it, please? You see it, please? Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier of this province and her ministers insist that their in energy decisions are business as usual. But there is a pattern, Speaker. No, There's a pattern that is very serious and very wrong. The Liberal Party benefits, the OPP investigates, and people pay more. 
That's the pattern of this Liberal government when it comes to the energy sector. The Premier has, tra has uh, promised transparency over and over again, Speaker. I think she does not know what that word means. Nope. I'm calling on her to keep that promise, Speaker. If everything is okay, if everything is above board, if there's no problem whatsoever, then the Premier's got nothing to worry about and the air can be cleared for the people of this province. So I ask her to take my question seriously, to actually give the people of uh, this province the respect they deserve. And and answer the question that I'm asking her. Not try to be obtuse about it, but ask the, answer the question that I'm asking her, which is, will she give Ontario people the answers they deserve and call a commission of inquiry into the awarding and management of public contracts in the energy sector in this province? Simple. So, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that there is a case before the court. She knows that we made a decision, Mr. Speaker, to uh, to gather evidence, to look at the research, Mr. Speaker. She knows. I would think that the NDP has got research on clean, renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, so she would know that there are decades of, uh, uh, decades of, of research that has been done on land-based wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. That same body of research does not exist for, uh, for offshore freshwater uh, siting of, uh, of turbines, Mr. Speaker. That research is being done, and we will take the responsible approach and await that, uh, the results of that research, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. A new question, the member from Rampton Kent Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the Premier. A year ago today, the Minister of Economic Development said, and I quote, I'd like to see us land a new manufacturing plant or two in the next five or ten years, unquote. He even went so far as to appoint an auto czar to make that happen. Yet the Minister of Environment has totally different plans. At the same time that he threatened the 50,000 jobs in the nuclear industry, he also took aim at the nearly one in six Ontario jobs that benefit from the auto industry. Speaker, the Minister of Environment described our Canadian manufacturers as, and I quote, lacking courageous leadership and doomed to have BMW and Tesla start eating our lunch, unquote. Mr. Speaker, for the second day in a row, which cabinet minister does the Premier side with? The minister who wants auto manufacturing or the minister who doesn't? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear all along that we are going to invest in our economy to create good paying jobs, and we have. The plan's been working. Over 603,000 net new jobs since the recession. We have become the top destination in all of North America for foreign direct investment, beating out California, Texas, New York, and every other province. And we do so because we are partnering with the auto sector, recognizing the transformations that they're making in manufacturing for value-added manufacturing, which, by the way, also is an improvement for our environment. They work hand-in-hand, -hand, Mr. Speaker. We're working closely together to improve our economy, improve our environment, and, Mr. Speaker, we're winning at this point. Well, uh, again to the uh, Premier. Speaker, just last year the Premier appointed Ray Tangay, the auto czar, to help bring new auto investment to our province. In one day, the Environment Minister has reversed much of that hard work. It's another day, another uninformed comment from the Environment Minister. Speaker, we've already lost General Motors in Windsor, the Ford plant near St. Thomas, and the GM plant in Oshawa could be next. If the GM plant leaves, it alone will cost Ontario $5.7 billion in GDP and over 33,000 well-paying jobs in Ontario. Speaker, that's right. why I wrote to Ray Tangay to see if he agrees with the minister's comments. Speaker, who does the Premier think should produce the government's policies on the auto sector? The expert with over 30 years' experience or Glenn Murray? Minister's title or writing, please. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question because it gives us the opportunity to, once again, talk about the importance of the auto industry, the importance of, concert, of continuing to support a sector which, by the way, Mr. Speaker, the progressive Conservatives voted against the opportunity to save the auto industry when it was most in need. They stood on their hands and they did not support what was necessary. And as a result of our ongoing support, since 2003, our government has invested over $1 billion in leveraging an additional $12 billion from the private sector for the auto 
auto industry. Ontario Mint owns four of the top five positions in the latest survey by J.D. Power Associates for the quality vehicles built in North America. Right. And over the past two years, Ontario has seen nearly four and a half billion dollars in new auto investments. This is helping create and sustain over 21,000 jobs in that very sector, as well as a peripheral sector that services those. Yes, that industry, Mr. Speaker. Auto industry is critical to Ontario, and we are going to continue to Thank support you. it, and we're going to continue to support Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley, Gore Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Currently, the OPP is investigating the Liberal government for gas pan scandals, Orange kickback, Sudbury bribery scandal. The House Leader, second now time. The OPP is investigating the Liberal government for deleting documents in a $2.25 billion lawsuit regarding the cancellation of wind contracts to save seats. Now, it Again. seems that this is the fifth OPP probe into this Liberal government. It seems every time we look at Liberal self interest, it leads to police investigations. Can the Premier explain this pattern? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the uh, question from the member opposite. Look, it's pretty clear, Speaker, that on this side of the House, open, transparent, and accountable uh, records is what this government supports. Look at Bill 8. Right, you know, the member opposite laughs. But when we introduced Bill 8 with higher standards for transparency and accountability, the NDP voted against it. Chance. They said they were loud yeah. about it, but they voted against it. What we created uh, an offence for up to $5,000 for the willful destruction of records, ensuring that all uh, chiefs of staff were designated uh, as the person accountable for records and compliance. We developed a mandatory training program with respect to that, and we uh, required that every institution have reasonable measures yes, to secure their records. And when we introduced Bill 8 to raise the standards and raise the bar in Ontario, this party Thank and you. those members. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a commission of inquiry would clear the air. It would clear the air with regards to the cancellation of the wind contracts and the destruction of documents. It would perhaps clean the air with regards to why this government is selling off Hydro One, and it would raise, it would answer probably maybe some questions around the Liberal government's part fundraising and the connection to the energy sector. Now, if the premier has nothing to hide, why not just clear the air? Will the premier do the right thing? and call a commission of inquiry into the awarding and management of public contracts in the energy sector, yes or no? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And, uh, you know, the OPP investigation will take place. It will take place as an independent investigation, and we're not uh, going to interfere in that in any way, nor should we. The importance of this, Speaker, is to ensure that we continue to raise the standard around record keeping, record retention. That's what our government is doing. And in fact, the Information Privacy Commissioner commented on that and specifically said, with regard to Bill 8, that they voted against. And with the steps that we've taken, I'm pleased to report that the Premier and the government have made significant progress in addressing each of the recommendations made. I appreciate the cooperation I've received uh, from Premier Kathleen Wynne. You know, Speaker, this I think speaks from Hamilton, to the East Stony Creek, second of this time. Premier in raising the standards for record keeping, retention, and ensuring that uh, yes, appropriate records are kept. This Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. As the question ended, I was ready to stand up and ask the member from Lanark to come to order and also the member from Kitchener-Waterloo. New, uh, uh, new question, sorry, the member from uh, Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. We, uh, we all agree that the quality of our air directly impacts our health, our environment, and the future of all Ontarians. I and the residents of Durham take particular, particular interest as we live east of Canada's largest city and our air quality changes are impacted by air in Toronto. So it is in my constituents and everyone's best interest that our air be as clean as possible. 
I understand that the 2014 Air Quality Report was recently released, marking 44 years of reporting on air quality in Ontario. Would the Minister please provide more details to the House on the findings of the 2014 Air Quality Report? Yep. Minister of the Environment. There's very, very good news in the air quality report, and I'd like to share it with the House, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew, second time. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the air quality, the state of air quality, of Ontario report has uh, shown some amazing progress. There were absolutely no smog advisories in 2014, and the province's air was rated very good for 94 percent of the year. The, uh, the 2014 air, Ontario Air Quality Report shows significant decreases in smog causing pollutants, specifically 42 per cent decrease in nitro nitrogen oxide, 49 per cent decrease in sulfur dioxide, 40 per cent decrease in member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, second time. Uh, just as a reminder, if you get to warnings the next time you're out. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 31 per cent decrease Answer. in a particular matter, Mr. Speaker. These are very significant reductions. As a matter of fact, they're record-breaking reductions. Yeah. Speaker. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, thank you to the Minister. The 2014 Air Quality Report seems to confirm that our actions are contributing to improved air quality and helping to fight climate change. I am glad to be part of a government that takes the health of our people and environment seriously. We have set a new air standard and rules for industry, air emissions, eliminated coal-fired power plants, continue investing in clean and renewable energy, and have placed emissions cap on sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. So all across Ontario, we are seeing improvements to air quality. Would the minister please provide the House with specific regional information coming out of the air quality report? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to do so. Ontario has a network of 39 outside air monitoring stations, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to give a bit of a summary of what's going on across Ontario. In Windsor, very good to good air quality 90 per cent of the time in 2014. Uh, not nit nitrogen dioxide concentrations, which are a problem in Windsor, are down 26 per cent, and sulfur dioxide down 58 per cent in Windsor. Amazing. In London, uh, very good air quality 91 per cent of the time in London, uh, nitric dioxide 58 per cent of them. Here in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, uh, very good to, to good air quality 93 per cent of the time, uh, nitrogen dioxide down 36 per cent, and over the same period, sulfur dioxide down a remarkable 75 per cent. In Kingston, Mr. Speaker, good air quality 94 per cent of the time, uh, nitro nitrogen oxide down 35 per cent. And in my parliamentary assistance, the great city of Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, air Answer. quality is good 97 per cent of the time, which is a record. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, uh, Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, volunteer groups were shocked this minister yep. allowed the Ontario Trillium Foundation to scrap its vital capital program. Yep. Yep. Now we learn the move is just part of what only can be described as a traumatic overhaul of Trillium. Yep. And it's all happening without input from frontline staff, Zero. OTF volunteers, or the communities this cherished program has served so well. Included in a proposal by the OTF board to dramatically reduce local input in the granting process by slashing the number of catchment areas from 16 to just five. Wow. Speaker, is the minister aware of this plan, and what is he doing to protect frontline jobs at OTF and ensure it continues to support volunteer groups in small towns and rural Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to start by saying how proud we are as a government to support the Ontario Trillium Foundation. We know that uh, the Trillium Foundation is a, such a successful uh, organization and, and it does great work right across the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this year our contribution as a government to Ontario Trillium is $115 uh, million that goes out uh, to many different parts of, uh, for, of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we, uh, we've invested $25 million uh, uh, to Ontario Trillium for 
for a new uh, community capital program that we know is going to support uh, the capital uh, build of uh, many different organizations uh, here in Ontario. And with Canada 150, we see this as an exciting addition to the celebration that will take place next year. We're very proud of our uh, of our Trillium Foundation Answer. and the uh, the local uh, boards that make the decisions at the local at the local level across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the minister, but from that answer, Speaker, it's obvious the, the minister doesn't know about the situation. Doesn't know. He'll be interested to know, though, that decisions made by local grant review teams were recently reversed by OTF's Central Liaison Committee after $3.4 million was left on the table at year end. Instead of going back to the local teams, these experts, this committee handpicked the winners by approving applications that were previously rejected. Yep. This behavior is eroding the role of local volunteers and program staff who know the communities that they serve. The good news is, though, the minister can stop it. The CEO's report to the board states very clearly the minister must approve the regionalization plan. Speaker, why is the minister allowing the board to proceed with this plan without insisting OTF conduct broad consultation first? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. And I'm, it sounds as though he has some concerns. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, there's a business plan that's presented to us as a ministry each year. Um, anything that's in, this in that business plan is approved by uh, me as the minister, and it goes through a, a very serious process uh, locally. Any type of major shift that happens in any of our agencies, Mr. Speaker, that affects the public is open to a discussion uh, locally. Um, Mr. Speaker, I continue to to, uh, uh, to uh, submit names that goes to cabinet that are approved for people uh, who serve on these 16 uh, boards. The 16 boards are currently intact, and uh, and they will continue to uh, to be in that position. Uh, that's the current plan. Now, if he has a specific item that he'd like to talk to me about, maybe perhaps a local uh, a local uh, board that's um, that's within his uh, area. Answer. I'd love to sit down and talk to him about that. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Leader of the op uh, third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When it comes to our health care, what's best for patients should always be the bottom line, Speaker. But this Premier is forcing Ontario's hospitals to make deep cuts to frontline care, and patients are the ones who are paying the price. More than 1,200 nursing positions have been cut since the start of 2015. Hospital beds are being shut down. Lab services and outpatient clinics are closing. Patients see what's happening to our health care spe speaker, and families are feeling it. And frontline workers and nurses know exactly how deep these cuts are, but the Premier doesn't seem to be listening. Speaker, what will it take for this Premier to stop cutting hospital care and restore the stable, predictable funding that our public hospitals deserve? Thank you, Mr. Long-term care. Mr. Health, long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this year in the budget, we've increased our hospital uh, line by 2.1 percent, well above the rate of inflation, Mr. Speaker. It's a $345 million increase. Uh, but at the same time, if we look, we're now entering year five of the changes, the quality uh, changes that we've made to our health care system, beginning with our hospitals. And we asked ISIS, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative, Evaluative Stu Sciences, rather, to do a preliminary evaluation of the impact. And here's what they found. In our hospitals, they found that we are seeing more patients, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. We're seeing a reduction in the average length of stay for surgical and medical admissions, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing, importantly, improvement in nursing-sensitive measures for selected conditions. We're seeing fewer falls, fewer, fewer pressure sores, fewer urinary tract infections, fewer in hospital cases of pneumonia. Yes, and we're seeing that, seeing that hospital readmission rates have not changed, Mr. Speaker. So we're actually seeing tremendous improvements with the changes we've implemented. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, for the past four years, base operating funding for hospitals increased by, just take a guess, zero. Speaker, zero percent. And now in 2016, notwithstanding the way the minister tries to kind of reclaim 
what's really in that budget. It's only a 1% increase to base funding in that budget. Page 116, he can ask his finance minister to look it up for him. It's no wonder that 1,200 nursing positions have been cut, Speaker. It's no wonder that people in Toronto hospitals are being treated in hallways. And it's no wonder that folks in Scarborough are having surgeries in operating rooms that were built in 1956. Health care is the silent crisis for this Liberal government. Why will the Premier do the right thing, Speaker? Stop the hospital cuts and ensure Question. funding for our hospital keeps up with inflation and population growth in our province. Thank you. Minister. Well, I know that the, uh, the leader of the third party understands that base funding is just part of the funding that hospitals receive. We're increasing the funding for operating for hospitals by 2.1 per cent this year, Mr. Speaker. But I understand that she's going back to their behaviour in the 1990s when they were in power. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do what they did in the last two years of NDP government, where they cut the health care budget two years in a row. We're not going to do what they did, where in their last year they reduced hospital funding by 1%. We're we're not going to do what they did when they were in power, which is close 13 per cent of the mental health beds. That's 300 beds. They closed 24 per cent of the hospital beds, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to invest in our hospitals, in our health care system. That's demonstrated clearly in the budget. The math does add up and make sense. This is a, a substantial investment, and I want to congratulate our health care workers for the excellent work that they do every day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Brampton West. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Today, we're pleased to have Family Services Ontario with us here in the Legislature. The FSO and its 48 member agencies play an integral role in this government's efforts to end violence against women and as well, and as, well as the transformation of Ontario's developmental services system. I'm proud that one of these agencies, Catholic Family Services Peel Dufferin, is located in my riding of Brampton West. They are the lead agency for the conjoint counseling pilot project, and, and I know that their executive director, Sharon Main Devine, is with us here in the House this morning. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the important work that FSO does to support vulnerable Ontarians and how the ministry Question. supports them in this? Good question. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Brampton West for the question. As the member has said, the work of Family Service Ontario and their agency touches thousands of Ontarians and helps to make the lives of the people they serve better. Here, here. FSO offers programs for children and adults with developmental disabilities. They receive ministry funding for community participation, caregiver respite services and supports, and case management services. Also, through funding provided by my ministry, FSO so agencies provide counselling and therapy for survivors of sexual abuse and family violence. The services provided by FSO and their member agencies are vital. I truly value the work done by FSO frontline workers and will continue to work closely with them in order to support vulnerable Ontarians. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Clearly, this government recognizes the great work organizations such as Family Service Ontario do in our province. In fact, I know that we continue to make investments that support some of our most vulnerable individuals. With the 2016 budget, our government has announced $2.4 million to pilot a new portable housing benefit that would offer more options for those fleeing domestic violence, benefiting nearly 500 Great households. Wow. $1 million Rural Re Realities Fund to help rural remote and northern agencies develop local solutions that address the unique challenges in serving their communities. 1.5 million in Aboriginal designed and delivered community service, including the development of an expanded province-wide counseling helpline for Aboriginal women. Minister, I have recently heard that counseling services through FSO have also been expanded. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share some of the details of this expansion with the House? Thank you. Minister? Yes, Mr. Speaker. And as part of our government's ongoing efforts to end violence against women, I'm pleased to let this House know that we're currently funding a two-year pilot project with FSO to provide joint counselling programs for couples experiencing situational couple violence. Yeah, yeah. This pilot will serve 100 couples from three pilot sites, one northern, one rural, and one urban, and a focus will be placed on serving 
serving the Aboriginal community as well as French-speaking clients. This pilot is part of work aimed at reducing the thinking, behaviours and conflict that may lead to domestic violence. This project is exploring the effectiveness of joint counselling for couples in lower-risk situational couple violence and whether early intervention would lead to prevention of further domestic violence. I'd like to thank FSO for being here today. Your work makes a real difference in the lives of thousands of Ontarians Answer. every day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, while families of children with autism struggle to deal with this government's removal of vital IBI services, others are facing further hardship in having their children's designated service dog approved for use at school. Families in the region of Waterloo have reported significant hurdles with the local board in not letting their child's trained service dog accompany them to school. These are trained professional dogs that are to be the child's constant companion, helping them overcome their challenges and improve social interactions. Speaker, does the minister agree that families of children with autism shouldn't have their service dogs taken away from them when they get to school? Here, good question. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and I I'm, I'm, uh, thank the member opposite for his, uh, his question. And uh, obviously, we are very concerned about the safety and the uh, health and, and the well-being of students with autism, or students with, quite frankly, a variety of other disabilities. Uh, we know that in many cases that uh, service dogs uh, do help children with disabilities, and that could be blind students or it might be deaf students in some cases, certainly autism students with a uh, variety of mental health issues uh, may have service dogs, and we, we know that there are a variety of circumstances. Uh, school boards are re responsible for uh, having their own policies. What I would say is that their policies, however, must be compliant with the Ontario Human Rights Act and must be compliant with uh, Ontario's equity and inclusive education policies. So there are provincial Thank you. law and policy. Supplemental. A lot of Speaker, uh, nine-year-old Jack and his dog Jensen will now be allowed on school grounds for just certain activities, but accommodation in the classroom has still yet to be addressed. Meantime, the father of a seven-year-old says the board jerked my chain for four months of process, followed by the, a flat denial in another case. The AODA calls for accommodations for people with service animals and the Ontario Human Rights Code speaks to the duty to accommodate persons with disabilities. We support service dogs for the blind, PTSD sufferers and others. Families of children with autism shouldn't have to face further hardships to get the same accommodations for their children. Speaker, will the minister commit to reviewing Ontario School Board service dog procedures and prevent further hardships for families Question. of children with autism. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. And uh, certainly the boards uh, are responsible for complying with the Ontario Human Rights Code and the, the uh, equity policies. But at the same time, I think it's, it's, it is important to understand that regardless what the dog is for, what, what a disability is being addressed. That these are individual circumstances, and the board does look at the board does look at things like the training of the dog, what whether or not the child, if the child is being left independently with the dog during class, the the training relationship between the child and the dog, and the ability to control the dog, or at least to make sure that the dog yes, is under control. So there are a variety of things that have to do with the individual child and the individual animal. Thank you. And that's why boards make Thank you. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la première... Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, for four straight years, hospital budgets have been frozen and or hospital have been forced to make deep cuts to patient care. Northern Ontario hospitals have been hard hit. Frontline workers have been laid off, beds have been closed across the entire north. 
in Sault Ste. Marie, Timmins, North Bay, Atticoke and Temiskaman Shore, and the list goes on. At the North Bay Hospital, more than 300 frontline workers have been cut in the last four years. But this government doesn't seem to care about cuts to patient care. When will the Premier stop the cuts to health care in the North and restore stable, predictable funding to Ontario hospitals? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member uh, opposite well knows that we continue to invest. Our health care budget goes up each and every year, an additional $1 billion to almost $52 billion this year alone. And those are important investments, and it includes $160 million dedicated solely to improving access and wait times for hospital services, things like cataract surgery and knee and hip replacements. Importantly, $7.5 million dedicated just for our small and rural hospitals, many of them in the north of the province. Uh, and that does not include a continuation of our small and rural hospital transformation fund, which is a $20 million annual fund just for the small and rural hospitals as well. $6 million of new funding for mental health hospitals. So we continue to invest. These are important Answer. investments in our hospitals. But we also need to recognize that we're transforming our health care system and moving more activities and support to Thank you. hospitals, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Northerners have a hard enough time gaining access to health care. We also face some of the greatest health inequity, and the last thing we see and we need is a premier that cuts our hospital. Health care in the North is a silent crisis of this Liberal government. Patients know it, Northerners know it, families know it, but the premier refused to admit it. My question is straightforward, Speaker. When will the Premier stop cutting Order. hospital care in Northern Ontario and make sure that, at the very least, hospital funding keeps up with inflation and Ontario population growth? Well, Mr. Speaker, the facts just don't support what the member opposite is alleging. We've increased hospital funding across the north by 54 wow. percent. We're building new hospitals right across this province, and seven new builds or substantial uh, additions are taking place in Thunder Bay, in Sudbury, in North Bay, Sioux Lookout, the Sioux Hospital, West Perry Sound, Mattawa General Hospital. We're making investments. The member well knows that I was in Sudbury not that long ago announcing a new pet scanner for the Sudbury, Sudbury Hospital, Mr. Speaker. We, have, we are investing like never before. We have a new school of medicine in the north, which has resulted in an increase of more than 20% 20, 20 more doctors being employed and working in the north before. Our first nurse practitioner-led clinic was in Sudbury in the north. We are investing in the northern part of this province in health care like never before, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Um, Speaker, the mining and exploration industry is an incredibly important contributor in my riding of Sudbury and, of course, to our provincial economy. Ontario is a leading jurisdiction for the exploration and production of minerals in Canada and a major player across the world. Mr. Speaker, one of the major players is the Ontario Geological Survey. This organization is responsible for documenting and communicating the geology of Ontario, and it has achieved many milestones for Ontario's mineral sector. Mr. Speaker, throughout the North today, the OGS is celebrating its own major milestone, its 125th anniversary. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about what the OGS Question. is doing for us in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Northern well, Development. Well, thank you. That's just a great question for the member for Sudbury. I mean, this year is the 125th anniversary of the Ontario Geological Survey. We could not be prouder. In fact, celebrations of uh, this historic occasion are happening all across Northern Ontario today. So I want to do a bit of a shout out, if I may, to the OGS members who may be watching today. Speaker, the OGS has been involved in some amazing and uh, cutting edge initiatives. Um, not everybody may know this, but the OGS worked with NASA on its missions to the moon in the 1970s. It's even connected to the first rock with evidence of water discovered on Mars. Uh, the OGS work has led to some incredible discoveries, Speaker, uh, such as a 9,000-year-old arrowhead near Wawa. The Ontario Geological Survey provides essential tools that are readily available to governments, 
to industry, communities at large, and these tools are critical Answer. to the ongoing development of Ontario's mineral sector. I am proud of the OGS. I know everybody in the House is happy to celebrate. It's Thank on the 25th anniversary. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. So, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the Ontario Geological Survey has an important role in helping to support Ontario's mineral sector. Ontario accounts for approximately 25 per cent of mining jobs in Canada, with about two-thirds of these jobs in the north. Mr. Speaker, I also understand that the mineral sector is the largest private sector employer of Aboriginal peoples in Canada, something to be very proud of, Mr. Speaker. So it is great to hear that our government has been taking steps to maintain Ontario's place as the top jurisdiction for exploration and production of minerals in Canada. Mr. Speaker, there have been many concerns recently about the mineral sector due to the global commodity prices. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about the OGS and the investments Question. that Ontario is making to support the mineral industry in our great province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. It gives me great pride to be able to say that um, today Ontario is Canada's leading jurisdiction for the exploration and production of minerals, in large part because of the work done by, uh, by the OGS. Uh, and the work of the Ontario Logical Survey has impacted an ex extraordinary number of initiatives. Uh, OGS mapping in the Werner Lake area north of Kenora led to an $11 million investment for cobalt exploration. Uh, OGS data was part of the early groundwork that led to the discovery of a uh, gold deposit near Fort Francis uh, and Emo and attracted private sector investment of uh, New Gold's Rennie River project, a very exciting new project. Uh, the work of uh, the OGS helped the municipality of Shelburne uh, find safe drinking water. So there's so many different initiatives. The list goes on and on. After 125 years of exceptional service and the public good, I am sure excited to say that the Ontario Geological Survey will continue its good work for many years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Thornhill. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la Première ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Despite the current situation, this government continues to see deaf and blind people as people they can save on, and this is cruel really cruel and there is only one bilingual school in Ontario in existence and if the government was to close the school it would mean cancelling all services for blind and deaf people in Ontario especially children will the government commit to help the school remain open thank you Thank you, the Premier. Thank you, the Minister of Education. Thank you. I, we're, we're back to talking about the provincial school and the demonstration school. In the case of Centre Jules Leger, it, it serves uh, both purposes. In terms of the, the demonstration school, uh, we know that uh, we've re we have reopened the uh, admission for uh, this next year, as we have with all the demonstration schools, and uh, we're, we're getting the report back now on how do we address the issue in the future. It's interesting at uh, Centre Jules Leger that uh, when you look at the children that, that attend actually the, the demonstration school there, that um, about half of them actually come yes, from northern Ontario. And we really do need to consider how to serve not just the cluster of uh, fr francophones who live in the Ottawa area, but also francophones who live in northern Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Merci. Thank you. Back to the Premier. There have been years of mismanagement by this government, years of scandals, and this is why the Premier is being forced to cut essential services, and this is in direct contradiction with evidence that demonstrates that such schools can really help children not to carry their deficiencies into adulthood. 
And so the Premier was forced to reopen admissions for 2016-2017 at the Jules Leger Centre. But given this children, giving these children one more year will not solve the problem. Will the Premier commit to keeping this centre open for the future? Thank you. The Minister. I think uh, that the member in her question has actually covered the issue, which is we know that the work that happens in the demonstration schools, be they francophone demonstration schools or English demonstration schools, we know that the work is highly effective in helping children who are multiple grades behind in the ability to read, that it actually is a very effective program at helping them re learn the, the skill of reading, which is essential to everything else. We we know they are effective. That's not the issue. The issue is that we have children all over Ontario who are struggling with the ability to read, and we need to make sure that the programs which will help those children to learn yes, to read, in fact, are available throughout Ontario, either in French or in English, as the case may Thank be. You. The member from Trinity Spadina on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I, uh, on point of order, I didn't get a chance to introduce four of my constituents uh, here with us in the members' gallery Mr. Hao Chen Fan, Mr. Hong Ke Zhen, Ms. Cici Liu, and Ms. Shang Tai. Welcome. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that uh, I have today laid upon the table the post-event report of the Whitby Oshawa by-election from the Chief Electoral Officer of Ontario. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.